Chapter 3, Looking at the Organization, Structure, and Culture. When examining project management structures, there's really three that we need to take a look at. The first one is the functional organization. The second one is the dedicated project teams, which is kind of what's reflected in this course. And then also you have to consider matrix structures. And within matrix structures, there's three options. A weak matrix, balanced matrix, and a strong matrix. As you might imagine, in the reading and in this presentation, we're going to take a long look at some organization charts and how they can be structured. Now, in a functional organization, top management decides to implement a project, and different segments of the project are then distributed to the appropriate existing area. So nothing new is created, it's just that the responsibilities of the project are spread across the organization. Coordination is maintained through normal management uh, channels. So if people still report to their superiors, they just have additional job responsibilities. It's commonly used when one functional area plays a dominant role in completing a project or has a dominant interest in the success of a project. So if engineering is come up, coming up with a new product, or they're designing a new product, they're kind of lead on it, if you will. Um, again, this looks like a traditional structure. Uh, you have a president up here, human resources, your VPs and your CFOs. And then you have all these major departments, marketing, engineering, manufacturing, procurement. Obviously, this can be different for different organizations. Now, within marketing, you have all your customer service, inside, outside sales, domestic, international, engineering, all your different departments and manufacturing, everything we need to, to make a product. And then, um, you know, you have procurement, which is like supply chain. So what is done here is the project said, hey, we need this new, new product. And it's divided across these departments as additional um, responsibility so it stays within the same corporate structure now some advantages here is there's no real change to that corporate structure there's some flexibility across departments uh, there's in-depth expertise in that you get specific feedback from say marketing and from engineering and so on and so forth and from manufacturing um, it's easy for a post-project transition because nothing really changed just take it off their plate Disadvantages, there's lack of focus. No one's really owning it. So there's a lack of ownership. It can be slower because it's additional responsibilities and there's poor integration into the corporate structure itself. So it can take a little longer um, and it might not move down the tracks unless someone really champions it. Now, organi organizing projects as dedicated teams, this is kind of what we're doing in this class, is dedicated project teams operate as units separate from the rest of the parent organization. It's their full-time focus. A full-time project manager is designated to pull together a core group of specialists who work on the project full-time. The project manager recruits necessary personnel from both within and outside the parent company. They're looking for experts who can speak directly to the project. In a projectized organization where projects are the dominant form of business, the entire organization is designed to support the project team. So it's not like something that, hey, you have this job and you also have to do this project teams. When we look at uh, functional setup, this one, the whole company is directed towards um, having success on this project. Project Titus is referred to as a negative dimension to a dedicated project teams. Um, it's a, a we, they, us versus them, right? Attitude can emerge between the project team members and the rest of the organization. So it can be quite competitive. And some people have more routine jobs and they're a little bit jealous of the people who get to have more creative jobs, for example. Or there's the blame game, you know, where people are saying, hey, cash cows, like we talked about in the last um, uh, present, uh, last chapter, rather, um, of saying, hey, they only got approved because of this person and their connections. Um, there's a lot of professional jealousy here. So, um, you know, there's, there's, there's pluses and minuses. Let's take a look at a dedicated project team structure. Uh, let's say you have the president, you have the CFO, uh, and the other VPs and human resources off here. And instead of laying the project across these di different departments, you create another branch over here, and it's like this special team that's broken out, okay? You have a project manager, and then you have the teammates. All right, that are brought in just to do this project. So instead of it being in this hierarchical, normal organization structure, we draw a line on this over here. Now, projectized organization structure. Uh, this is the one where the whole organization is set up to develop um, new projects. You have your president, you have your human resources, your, your, your vice president of marketing, your CFO, um, your chief of legal counsel. Um, and then you have competitive projects. You have alpha project, beta project, okay? And then they each have their own little subdivisions. So you can see here, 
Uh, and this may go on infinitely. Uh, this is common in research and development companies, R&D companies, where you have a, you know these little project hierarchies within a larger, more corporate hierarchy. And there may be hundreds, dozens, whatever, of projects on either side here. The whole organization here is set up for success on projects. And so it gets a little competitive. There's a little bit of looking over the fence here. Um, so there's some positives and negatives. Let's take a look at the strengths of this type of dedicated project team approach, um, whether it's projectized or its own branch. So again, its own branch and projectized. Okay. Strengths and weaknesses, they're simple. They're fast. They focus on the project. They're cohesive. They're a team. And they have cross-functional integrations. You have you know, a marketing person, engineering person, a finance person, all in one team. One of the weaknesses is pretty expensive. If you're dedicating time and money to projects that may or may not get off the ground, that's going to cost money. There can be internal strife in that. There's competitive competitiveness. We all know in group projects there can be uh, internal strife within the team, but also between teams. There's limited technological expertise in that you don't have like a full engineering department say saying, you know, hmm, we should design it this way, or a full manufacturing department saying, this is going to be kind of impossible to make. Um, there's also difficult post-project transition in that you're dedicated to one particular thing. Now you have to be reintegrated in, back into a corporate structure if you're these folks, or you have to move on to a different project if you're these folks. So it's a difficult post-project transition. Now, organizing projects with a matrix arrangement. Matrix management is a hybrid organizational form in which horizontal project management structure is overlaid on the normal functional hierarchy. There are two chains of command along with one functional line, um, along with functional lines, I should say, and um, the other uh, along project lines. So you're going to see some cross responsibilities. Um, a lot of people see it as like, hey, I got two bosses now. Um, that can be not, not a good thing. It also could be pretty awesome. And project participants report simultaneously both to both the functional and the project managers. That's the two boss part. Um, the matrix structure is designed to utilize resources optimally. So there's a focus on that. And you're trying to use your time and your money uh, wisely. So individuals work on multiple projects as well as uh, being capable of performing normal functional duties. Normal functional duties, I should say. It attempts to achieve greater integration by creating and legitimizing the authority of the project manager. It gives them a little more leeway. Um, to provide, it provides a dual focus between functional and ex technical, technical expertise and project uh, requirements. Man, I could talk myself into circles and tongue twisters and all of this. Let's just look at what it looks like. This is a matrix organization structure. Okay. You got your president over here, you got your HR, you got your CFO over here. Then have you have your traditional departments like engineering, manufacturing, marketing. This isn't, you know, limited. This is just the ones we're using in this chapter. Um, the engineer has a design engineer, electronics, software, mechanical, technical, manufacturing has assembly, testing, quality control. Marketing has customer service, domestic sales, international sales, what have you. But then you have this offshoot over here where you have a director of projects, Okay. And then you have a project administration. Then you have project manager for project A, project manager for project B, project manager for project C. They report to the director of projects. The project administration is putting together these teams that these project managers work with, you know, A team, B team, C team, and then they coordinate across all of these different aspects of the organization. So project A has a, you know, a team lead. They have someone in the project administration. They have a design engineer, electronics engineer. Apparently they don't need software. They have a mechanical engineer and technical documentation. They must not be anywhere close to end users because they they don't have anything in marketing, but they have someone who's an expert in assembly, someone who's who's uh, working a little bit on te texting, uh, texting, testing. You guys are working a little bit on texting, I'm sure. Um, but only part-time, and then they have a quality assurance person. So they've got two mechanical engineers, a design engineer, uh, two people on the assembly team, somebody checking in every now and then and testing, and one person on quality control along with their project team manager. And you can see how that repeats across these different projects. These, So I would say my guess here would be these aren't close to being finished because there's a lot of design going on here and no end-user marketing. This one, there's still some design, but we must be closer to market because there's more people in the marketing. Um, Project C, 
very little design and engineering, no manufacturing, so that must be taken care of, and, and a lot of marketing. So this one, I would say Project C is closer to being launched. That's just my guess. But you can see with the resources that they use across the organization how the matrix works and which ones are closer to market. Now, the division of project manager and functional uh, manager responsibilities in a matrix structure. So in this, what, what do people do? We project manager has to ask what, what has to be done. When should this task be done? How much money is available to do the task? And how well has the total project been done? Now you have negotiated issues like who will do these tasks like you know based on what has to be done and then the function manager say how will it be done and then when we're talking about when should it be done where should it be done okay functional manager is not needed there to answer that how much money is available why will the task be done to justify the spending that money and how will the project involvement impact normal functional activities so this is your more normal like function of the organization. This is the project manager who's thinking outside the box. So you've got functional managers over here, right? And then you've got project managers over here. This is where they coincide. So I'm kind of like putting my fingers together. This is where they cross over. That's the matrix. Um, and then obviously, how well has the total project been done? That's your feedback loop. Was it satisfactory? And how well did it integrate into the functional areas? Now, I promised you three different forms of... Uh, matrix form. So uh, weak matrix, this is a form that's very similar to a functional approach where the exception there is that it's a uh, formally designed project manager responsible for coordinating activities. So if you remember uh, the functional one was where this project is just divided across the existing organization. Now add to that a project manager who's the champion of it and drives it, okay, and now you have a weak matrix. Functional manager is responsible for managing their segment of the project. So they're the owner. It takes out that one negative when we're talking about the disadvantage. And the project manager acts as a staff assistant who draws schedules, checklists, collects information on the status of work, and facilitates project completion. Now, the balance matrix is the manager is responsible for defining what needs to be accomplished. The project manager establishes an overall plan for completing the project and integrates the contribution of different disciplines, set schedules, and monitors progress. So here... The focus is on functionality. Here, it's balanced between functionality, what we normally do, and the project. The functional managers are concerned uh, with how it will be accomplished because they're like, man, I already got enough to do. I don't need this extra work. Um, man, I can sympathize with that being an academic administration. But anyway, uh, the functional managers are responsible for assigning personnel and executing their segment of the project according to standards and schedules set by the project manager, but they also got to get their other jobs done. So again, weak in that it's more like a functional team balanced in that it's more um, a, a kind of 50-50 between the project and the function. And then a strong matrix, the project manager controls most aspects of the project, including scope of trade-offs and assignment of functional personnel, i.e. they got more power. Um, the project manager control, controls when and what specialists do and has the final say on major project decisions. This is kind of where the company set up specifically for projects. Uh, the functional managers have title over the people and are consulted on 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 need basis, and the functional managers serve as subcontractors to the project. So it's definitely a a, uh, a project focused organization. Advantages and disadvantages of matrix management. Advantages are they efficient. They have strong project focus and easier post project transition in that they jump into other projects. Um, they also have existing functional things so that if the project's taken away, whoo you breathe a sigh of relief and you work on your functional aspects, but you're also able to reincorporate new projects, so it's pretty doggone flexible. Disadvantages is there's dysfunctional conflict. Again, you have two bosses, so that can lead to infighting, both in the teams and both with your superiors. It's pretty doggone stressful, and sometimes people can have so much on their plate they don't get a whole lot done, so it can be slow. Now, Project Management Office, otherwise known as a PMO, is a centralized unit within an organization or a department that oversees and supports the execution of projects plays a critical role in helping the matrix system mature into more effective project delivery platforms. This can be can, uh, characterized in different kinds. Um, you know, there's different examples of, ooh, I am so sorry. Different examples here. You can have a weather station that tracks and monitors project performance, i.e. Uh, forecast the project, control tower, think of like an air traffic control tower, improves the project uh, execution, rather. Um, it's very controlling, very organized, very, you do this now, turn left now, do this with this project. You have a resource pool that provides the organization with a cadre of trained project managers and professionals. It's kind of like a 
a pool of experts within an organization. Think of like a job placement type thing, but within an organization, be like, hey, you know, Susie's really good at this. Let's put her on this project. So you have this resource pool you can pull from. Command and Control Center has direct authority over the project. So that's that very, um, you know, strong matrix, if you will, that has a lot of influence. Now you have organization considerations. So which one do you want to, you know, which structure do you want to use? How important is the project to the success of the firm? What percentage of core work involves the projects? Does it, does it need to be weak? Does it need to be balanced? Does it need to be strong? And what level of resources do we have available? You have to consider the following things on the project. The size of the project, the strategic importance, which kind of speaks to what we were just talking about, novelty and need for innovation, need for integration, number of departments involved. Uh, we saw in the one matrix that um, not every department had to be involved with a particular thing. Like if it's just brand new, sales really isn't in on it, marketing is in on, in on it as well. Uh, but if it's later on, they have to be involved. If it's very early on, you might need engineering and research in there very, you know, pretty heavily. There's environmental complexity, number of external um, interfaces. So what's going on in the market that you're servicing? How will that affect if you redirect resources to a project? Budget and time constraints. Um, so how much time, how much money do we have to go towards a project? That'll determine how big the project is, which will then determine what the right project management structure is. And then the stability of those resource requirements. How, how often can we count on having the time and the money to be able to do this? Now, organizational culture, culture man, we could talk days about this, probably its own course, is a system of shared norms, beliefs, values, and assumption that, um, I'm pretty sure that's not supposed to be blinds, binds people together. Let's fix that. Binds people together and thereby creates shared meanings. It reflects the personality of the organization. It performs several important functions in an organization. It provides a sense of identity for its members. Do you take pride in your work? Are you happy going to work? Um, helps legitimize the management system. Clarifies and reinforces standards of behavior. Um, my pleasure. I always think about the Chick-fil-A model here, which was um, derived out of the Ritz-Carlton um, you know, um, uh, Horse Schultze, um, Excellence Wins is a great book if you want to check it out. Uh, clarifies and reinforces the standards of behavior, how you want your customers to feel, how you want your employees to feel. If your employees are happier coming to work, that's a culture thing and they'll be happier doing their work, which means their end user will be happier with how they were served. Um, and it helps create a social order. Now, I've seen bad cultures where that social order is chaos and I've seen great cultures where that social order is incredible care uh, for the product or service. Now, identifying cultural characteristics, study the physical characteristics of an organization, read about the organization, observe how people interact within the organization, interpret story, stories and folklore surrounding an organization. I've done a little bit of light consulting in this area, and I'm here to tell you. People will tell you, all you have to do is ask, what do you like about working here? What do you not like about working here? It's like a pro-con list, and you can tell very quickly how the culture, how far it needs to go or where it's at, whether the pros have like a heavy lean or if the cons, you know, if it's a lot of complaining, that's not a good sign for culture. All right. Implications of organizational culture for organizing projects. Project managers interact with the culture of their parent organizations as well as the subcultures of various departments. The projects, clients, and, or customer organizations. So as a PM, as a project manager, you're going to interact with your organization and also your clients and customers. Other organizations connected to the project, such as suppliers, vendors, subcontractors, so like these third parties you work with, consulting firms, government, and regulatory agencies, and community groups. That's going to tell everyone about your culture, how you go about interacting with those people, the people inside, the people outside, and the people that you work with, like your suppliers. A riverboat trip is a metaphor describing the relationship between organizational culture and project management. Those can be really fun or it can be a complete disaster. The culture is the river, so that's what you float on, and the project is a boat. If your culture is bad, it's like being on the rapids with some waterfalls. If your culture is smooth, you can enjoy the cruise. All right, well, that's a high 20,000-foot view at Chapter 3, Organization Structure and Culture. Please make sure you're doing the reading this week. See you next time.